thank you everybody for coming today. I hope you enjoy the event as much as I do uh, in this very beautiful venue. Um, so without further ado, uh, ado um, my name is Michael Barbero. I work at the Eclipse Foundation. I'm the head of security. And today I will present you a tool that we've developed to manage hundreds of GitHub organizations that we have to manage on a daily basis and thousands of Git repositories. So for those of you who don't know about the Eclipse Foundation, um, you may have heard about the Eclipse ID, our original project, but we are actually the, the home of uh, many, many projects, so more, more than two, 420 projects. Um, we are the home of Demarine, Jedi, Capella, OpenADX, Mosquito in the uh, IoT world, Kipple, Cura, whatnot. You may recognize some of those um, projects. And what we provide to those projects is a set of services, based services for open source. So we provide an infrastructure so that they can uh, build, uh, run their build, or their source code, and so on. We provide marketing, ecosystem development, uh, provide uh, IP management, and licensing um, uh, tooling. Um, and we also now uh, provide help in improving the security posture of the supply chain. And one of our original roots in why we are, why we are very well known of is our very strong governance. And this very strong governance tells us a lot about how we should manage our organization at GitHub, for instance, and our, rep our repositories and so on. So keep in mind that we have a very strong governance. Uh, I will repeat that a couple of times during the presentation and the, the reasoning behind this tool. So how it started? Um, thanks to sponsorship from the OpenSSF Alpha Omega project, um, we started uh, an audit of all of our GitHub repository last year in August. Uh, you can find the full report at this link. And what we found is that some of the uh, score from the scorecard uh, was actually not great. Um, so many, many of our projects, many, many of the repositories of our projects actually don't have any branch protections. At this scale, uh, we have about 700 repositories enabling branch protection, all of them manually, it's just a no-go. So we need to tame the uh, GitHub uh, at our scale. Again, today we have 150 organizations at GitHub that we need to manage. Uh, with more than thousand repositories, and it keeps growing uh, and growing. So our requirements, again, um, to comply with the strong governance we have for our projects, um, the very first one is that we, we want to support the definition of default settings, um, and but also the, the, the ability for our projects to override some of those um, uh, settings. So the default one would be the secure one, um, but there is no one size fits all, right? Uh, sometimes you want uh, you have exceptions, you have very specific use cases why you want to be able to override that at one specific project. Um, what we want to be able to do is also to support all other kind of settings because we are not only talking about security settings but mm, other general settings uh, for organizations and uh, repositories at GitHub. So we wanted to be able to support all of those but also including some of those settings that are not available or reachable through the APIs made available by GitHub. So you may or may not know that some of the settings that are available through the UI have actually no public API whatsoever available for GitHub, from GitHub. So th that was one of our requirements. We wanted it to be non-disruptive at setup, so whenever we deploy the tool uh, on our projects, we don't want to um, change the settings at that time. We want to retrieve all the settings, the, the, a snapshot of the current configuration, and then we start to iterate and communicate to, with the projects to change and improve the security posture of their settings. But we want the deployment to not ch change anything. Another one is, of course, we don't want to make it easier for attackers to, <laughs> to target our project, so we don't, want, we don't want to leak any settings that is not visible by default uh, via GitHub API. So for instance, the branch protection rules need to be authenticated and, and have specific permission on the repository. Not everybody can see those settings, so we don't want to expose them. And also, uh, the last requirement is to be able to let our project actually see their settings, so they, they it improve the, their trust in our management of their repositories, um, but it will also help them uh, have a more self-service regarding the change of settings. So currently, um, well before this tool, uh, if they want to add um, a branch protection rules, for instance, they have to open a ticket at our help desk asking us to do that for them. 
that's quite cumbersome. If we provide a tool where it's easier for them to know what's the current state and change it, raising a PR, for instance, um, it's for the best. So how it's going? That's the tool we've been developing. It's called Autodog. Um, so you may get the, the pun behind Autodog, Autodog being the, the, um, the species that actually eat octopus, and <laughs> dog being the best friend of cats. So in one sentence, Autodog is a command line to, to, administer, to administer GitHub resources, organization, and repository settings, including as code. So what kind of settings do we support? So we support everything um, regarding organization settings, even those that are not accessible via API. And there are some of them that are actually very uh, security sensitive. So for instance, there is a settings called member can change repository visibility. That's something that is only available through the GitHub, AP, uh, the, the GitHub website. That is not, you cannot change these settings through any of the public API from GitHub. So if you want to enforce the fact that none of the organization you manage let the, 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 their members to change uh, repository, repository visibility, so changing from public to private or private to public, you have to do that through the UI. So we can understand that with 150 and counting organization, it's not something that you want to do to manage manually. We manage webhooks and all the repository, repository settings, including the branch protection rules. So again, a link to the, the GitLab repository on our website with the list of supported settings. So how does it work? Um, at a very high level, each organization that we manage will get a dedicated private repository. Why private? Because we don't want to leak any sensitive information with a configuration file. This configuration file is written in the JSONet format. Um, you may or may not know JSONet. I will explain it a little bit later uh, exactly how it works, but it's very convenient to allow overriding of stuff, of the settings. Um, so each organization that we have, the, the 150 organization, will have one private repository with a configuration file inside it. This configuration files look like that. So it's very, um, very common. If you know about the, the GitHub API, you will recognize many of the same wording uh, for, for each settings um, on GitHub. So you set the billing email, uh, whether you, um, you require web signing, uh, the webcoming sign off, and, and so on and so on pretty standard. Now, what this file does explicitly in the uh, very first line is to import uh, a common default. And this common default comes from yet another organization or yet another repository in a different organization, which is our own that um, we define and none of our developers have access except the security team where we define the, the default values for all of our organizations. So this um, default setting actually implements a JSONet API, we can call it like that, where whenever we want to create a new organization, here are the, is the, the, the settings, for instance, for whether they have projects, they support projects, uh, what is the default, default permission for each repository for members, and so on and so on. So any new organization inheriting from or calling this implementation of our API will get those default values. So we end up with something very standard. Um, if we look at uh, an object orientation um, um, point of view, so we have our own defaults in a master, uh, um, a master organization with the default settings, the default files, and each of our organization, 150, not only three, will inherit called the parent one. So how does it help with security in this thing? That really because we define those default settings and the less the each organization settings deviate from this default, um, so the less there is over overriding, uh, the closer it is to our secured um, settings. So let's have a little demo. So I took very little risk uh, for this one. I registered an ASCII NEMA demo, so it should go fine. So the first thing we do is we are in the context of uh, a security admin who wants to change some of the settings on one of our, organiza organization. So we, we use uh, the, the master 
the, the master settings, and currently in there we have only a single uh, file called um, author OSS Summit 2023.jsonnet, so that's our organization that we want to change. In real life, we would have 150 files in there for in our case. So if we look at the content of this file, it will be very similar to the one I've shown statically in the slides before. So we, we see that it imports the defaults and it overrides the number of settings. So for instance, it allows uh, all members to change repository visibility. Um, it uh, does not require two-factor authentication. It does not require web, web commit sign off. And uh, there is only one repository in this organization and this repository also uh, allow a bunch of insecure settings. Why do I know because uh, it is insecure? That's because it's actually overridden from the default and I know that the defaults are more secure than any overriding that uh, can, can have been defined in there. So what we want to do now is to edit this file and remove basically every overriding in there. So I will change the email address just for the sake of the demo and then we will remove everything that is not um, in the default. So this thing, I don't know what it is about, but I'm pretty sure the defaults is more secure than whatever I could decide to do here. I change the description again for the sake of the demo. Remove everything about membership permissions, everything regarding packages, permissions. And I remove the web comic sign off required. Say that. And now we will want to apply. So in order to do that, we will call a command line tool called autodoc.sh. So it's just a wrapper around the the actual tool, uh, the wall author dog is not a shell script, it's actually implemented in, P in Python. Um, and we want to validate whether the settings are okay or not. So when we call validate, uh, all it does is running locally a bunch of rules that we've implemented that actually encode some of the, or many of the, um, the de facto, um, implement um, validation rules that GitHub has behind its API. So everything that is written to the doc or may not be actually documented, like if you do, if you activate these settings that you cannot do that anymore and so on, we replicated that into Autodog in order to be able to validate offline the, the content of the files. Um, so here you can see that for the repo name test repo, the web commit sign off required is set to disabled while we remove this, um, uh, while we've activated or we, we are now requiring that at the organization level. So GitHub would reject that and the tool detect that before actually deploying the stuff. So we will go back to the um, JSON file. We remove this disablement in the file and now we validate the settings and everything is okay. So now we will want to plan, so for those who know uh, about Terraform, you will uh, recognize many of the actions from Terraform. It's very similar, we, we like Terraform and we, uh, we, get a lot of, we got a lot of inspiration from them. Um, so planning is about checking what we would be achieve, achieve sorry, if we eventually uh, deploy the, change, the changes. So here you get um, a diff, if you want, about the remote configurations and your local file definition. So if I apply now this file, I know that I will change the billing email, I will change the dependable alerts enabled for new repositories and so on and so on. And for sing, uh, every single um, settings, you have uh, the old version and the new versions. So that's for the organizations and we see that there is no changes for repositories or webhooks. So now that we've verified that, we want to apply the changes. So apply the changes actually, revalidate first, then plan you will see that it will actually display the exact same UI. And finally, ask you to uh, confirm that you want to apply the, the, the changes remotely on the GitHub organizations. There is a dash dash force um, parameter if you want to not have this confirmation, but when we are doing that outside of CI CD, it's best to validate manually. And finally, the last step is to push the config and pushing the config means that we want to upload the new version of the organization files 
So the author doc demo that Jason had filed, the one for my organization, we want to push that to the um, repository that holds that in the organization, where it is stored. And the new file now is very simple, very simple, very streamlined, and nothing regarding security. We delegate everything to the default. So on the, on the two screenshots, so the, the one on behind, it's the old states, so without any binning, um, sorry, those two are old states, previous states, so there is no binning address uh, on the first one, or the, the binning address is actually my, my Gmail address. Uh, you can see that there is no private, um, no dependency graph enabled, no dependable depend alerts enabled, and if we, that's the new status after applying the configuration via Autodog, um, so all of the settings have been uh, applied properly. So Autodog is not only about changing settings, but you can also create new repositories and inherit from the default settings um, in the parent. So let's look at, again, a short demo. So we are in the same context, a single organization. I will edit the file and add a new repository to this file. So in order to do that, I will call the, the API from the default, so the org.new repo, to create this second repository. And I want the secure default from the, from the parents, so I won't, set, I won't set any settings except a very short description. So once it's done, we will do the same. We will first validate the configuration. It should not find any issue. Uh, we want to plan just to verify that everything is all right um, and um, uh, will be deployed properly. Uh, actually, uh, I apply directly. I don't plan because I will see the changes uh, at the apply time. And we see from here that the new repo will be created. Uh, so the name is really the name that we, we, we've set. Uh, where the new, yeah, a second repo and the description is properly set and all the other settings comes from the inherited default. It's not the defaults from uh, GitHub. So I will validate that I want to create this repo. Um, and there was an issue with, um, oh, we think GitHub has a bug in, this, in that font. Uh, on, the, on that side, uh, we have to apply twice in this case, but it has been fixed since the demo has been recorded. So you, know, you don't have to apply only once to create a new repo. But a couple of days ago, we had this issue where we had to apply twice the, to create a new repo. Um, and the new repo has been created. Uh, so we started with this state. So the test repo was the first one that you were seeing. The dot eclipse fdn dash private repo is the one the, where we store the configuration for this organization. And now, after creating the second repo, of course, it, uh, it appears in the, in the organization. So we can add many other settings. We can configure everything uh, for each organization and each repo. We can add branch protection rule. Again, we have some nice default for branch protection rules, or what we think is nice default and secure defaults. Uh, you can implement your own, or you can override your own branch protection rule for each repository or for each uh, protection rules and so on. So for instance, if you want to bypass uh, to, to allow some force push uh, for some um, pass in the repo or to, to change the push restriction and so on, you can do that directly in the file. So how does it work internally? So as I said earlier, it's written in Python 3. It uses uh, JSONet uh, as a data modeling toolkit. Um, and I, I will dig a little bit deeper into JSONet. And it uses JSONet Bundler to, uh, as a package manager for JSONet, so that's what links the um, the parent repo, the, the one defining the default and the sub, uh, the organization level settings. It accesses GitHub via the REST API and Graph GraphQL API and also the web UI directly for the settings that are not available for um, REST and GraphQL from via GraphQL and REST. Um, of course, to change things in GitHub, you need some credentials. Um, so we have implemented two credentials provider. Uh, 
via pass and bitwarden so you can store your uh, credentials to to reach github uh, in those two um, and of course it can be extended and again a link to the repository where you can find the tool so chestnut who knows about chestnut just nobody perfect um, <laughs> So JSONnet is a super set of JSON to, and the, the nice property about JSONnet is that it is side effect free. So whatever is written in JSONnet, you can really run um, the generation every single time and you will get the same output from the, for the same input. So it's very handy to, um, to reuse parts of JSON, um, JSON object that you, want, you have to repeat in a lot of places. So for instance, here we have the person one, which is almost standard JSON, except that you see that you can reference other attributes from uh, the, the current object with the self.name thing. And you can create a new person, person two, by referring the other person one and extending it or overriding the name attribute uh, for this specific object. And you get, if you give this file as an input to the JSONnet binary, then you get the output.json uh, on the right side. You can also define a um, method. So here we, c we, um, we define a, s a kind of constructor for a person that takes a parameter uh, with a default value and you create this object, um, this person object from the parameter. And then you can call it at several places in the file. So person one is person which will take the default value from the parameter Alice and for Bob, it will be overridden and you get the same output. And you can go even further. So JSONnet allows you to define libraries or external files and to import that uh, from one JSONnet file to another. So here we have um, a cocktail um, definition files and when you want to create a Negroni, you need to have um, three equals parts of Gin, Vermouth and Campari. And in order to have the three equal parts uh, and not repeat the kind, uh, Gin quantity one, Vermouth quantity one, and compare quantity one, you can reuse a library that you can define externally in a separate file. So that's the util.clipsonet uh, at the bottom, and that takes an integer and the list of ingredients, an array of string. And you can see that uh, you can loop on the array and create an object for each element in this array. And as it is called into from here, you will create a list containing a kind, a list of objects with for each a kind and a quantity. The, the quantity being the, 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 the results of size divided by the list of, the, the size of the ingredients. And you get this output over there. So, very convenient when you want to override stuff and define or generate large uh, JSON file from a subset of um, a very small library very small functions. And that's exactly how we define that um, for Autodog. So we have a set of functions in the top level organization with the defaults. The set of functions implements the default value, the one that we think are secured, or the one that, we, that implements our strong governance. And then at each organization level, they will call those functions, the, um, overriding some of the settings or not. Um, and the results will be a complete file with all the settings um, combined, merged. The, the thing is, if you start to reference another file from uh, the, the organization level, you, you will find yourself in a difficulty for, okay, it's a local path, uh, I will have to clone at the proper location, and I will have to, to have those two repositories, uh, one beside each other. The good thing with JSONnet, there is um, an ecosystem with JSONnet bundler, very similar to package.json, where you can define dependencies across repositories in order to retrieve files uh, or libraries of JSONnet files in other repositories. So what we do for each organization, so we have the JSONnet file encoding the specific settings for each of the, or for 150 organizations, and also a JSONnet um, um, a, a JSONnet bundler file, if you want, a package of JSON referencing all default. It's a good thing because you can you can reuse or you can define your own you can reuse sorry Autodog 
and also reference another default than ours. You don't depend on us on defining those defaults. Um, so that's what let us um, do exactly what you can see at the first line, so we can now import the defaults from a repository vendor, vendor and this vendor repository, this vendor folder, sorry, is created by the execution of uh, JSON bundler installed. So just like when you do npm install some, uh, your package or JSON, you will get all your dependencies in a folder, and then you can reference those from this folder. And that's how this whole graph actually take place. So what do we do for, um, um, or how do we call the, 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 how do we retrieve the, the GitHub settings? So for most of the settings, the REST API is perfectly okay. Uh, we use also GraphQL for the branch protection rules um, because it's not exposed properly by the REST API. And for the list of the settings below, we had to directly call the web UI. So for that, we use Playwright. Um, you may or may not know Playwright. Uh, it's kind of puppeteers if you, puppeteers, if you know about puppeteers. It's normally um, an end-to-end -end testing for web apps. So basically, you encode uh, that you want to open a new browser and you want to click on this button programmatically. And we use that to actually open a headless browser and uh, put credentials into the login form of GitHub and go to the settings page and read the value of the checkbox and so on. So that's the only solution we found to be able to manage those settings that are not available uh, via the, the API. There are numbers of um, support requests for GitHub to actually provide API access to those settings. Uh, it has been dead letter for, for a couple of years, so we had to, in order to scale, we had to find a solution and that's the one we've uh, came up with. So we know it's brittle because whenever GitHub decides to change um, the way they display the, the, um, their settings, we will have to adapt. Um, and also sometimes GitHub is down, it happens. Uh, yesterday or the day before, I can't remember. Um, so if you want to still be able to deploy stuff if the web UI is broken and so on, we also provide um, a flag in order to, to skip all the web settings. So now for the credentials providers, um, as we call the REST API, we need personal access token because that's how you, inter you interact with the, the REST and GraphQL API at GitHub, but you also need some user with username, password, and uh, some two-factor um, time-based one-time password seed in order to be able to connect to the UI. Um, and we implemented this support in, with two credential provider, but of course it's extensible to any other, and if you uh, want to use a dog and uh, have a credentials provider that is not implemented, please uh, contribute. We are welcoming those. Um, so, just briefly, how do we mm, support, for instance, the, the credentials in PASS? Um, so PASS is a local password manager that encodes every single credential that we pass to it uh, via GPG keys. Um, we request, or we support it the way that each credentials or each part of the credentials, the username, the password, uh, the token, and the TOTP seed needs to be in the different entry, but the name of ent each entry is um, are configurable. For Bitwarden, so Bitwarden is a very common uh, password manager, very well-known password manager, um, very similar to LastPass, uh, Dashlane, and so on. Uh, so for this one, it's um, a bit different. We, re we require all the credentials to be in a single entry, a single item, and for the personal access token, because it's not the credentials in terms of user and password, we ask it, we require it to be in a custom field. That's what you can do in Bitwarden. You can add custom field and. Uh, but the name of this field can, is configurable as well. So now if we put ourselves uh, in the seat of the administrator, the person we will have to manage those 150 organizations, you will start with this kind of file. So on the left, some metadata will explain about it, and on the right, you will have the list of organizations that you want to manage. So here I have three. Uh, so we have the name, the GitHub ID, the GitHub handle uh, that will, um, the of the organization that you want to manage, and also the credentials you will need to use uh, in order to um, to connect and to change the settings in those organizations. On the, the left, uh, it's basically some metadata. So what is the base template? What is the default organization, the default repository where the default settings will be stored? 
what is the name of the folder where it will be stored locally when you will apply the tools and so on. Um, so how does it work um, when we want to import or manage a new organization that is not managed by Autodoc at first? So I have a brief demo for that. So we are in the same context again, um, very similar context. So we have an autodoc.json file, so that's the one uh, having the, the, it's the root uh, files, settings files for the, the administrator uh, with the organization settings and the credentials in order to connect to these organizations. So the first thing we will do is to actually fetch the configuration to import all the settings. Again, that was one of our requirements. We don't want to be um, uh, disruptive when we import, when we deploy a dog on a new organization. So the first thing is to read everything and to create a new uh, JSON file that encode the current snapshots, the current settings of the organization. So that's the results of this import. That, uh, so the defaults are actually encoded as a JSON, so we extend the, the default with only what is different exactly for, from the default. So we, it's very easy to generate a full, um, a full version of the defaults and to only encode in this import the, the differences. So we've imported We've imported the, the current the snapshots, and now if we do plan, just like if we wanted to deploy it, of course there will be no changes. That's the current um, the current definition of the organization remotely. But there is one because we will eventually want to store the settings in a remote repository, the Eclipse FDN dash private repository, where we will store the the settings for this organization. So we still have one changes when we import a new one. So we want to apply that and create the, the new repository. And the final step when we want to deploy a dog is to actually push the config, so to push these new settings that we've imported to the newly created dot uh, FDN private repository. So we end up with, so we started with this uh, fresh uh, organization not managed by Autodog to these things with the new repository and the configuration files that match the current settings um, of the organizations. So why, why do we think it's uh, very valuable? So you may have seen that uh, two days ago, um, GitHub made a change uh, and make it, make it generally available to enable branch protection for public re repositories. We've been able to react to that very fast, uh, so we enable the support for this setting at the organization level. We change it um, in the default, so we want all of our organizations to actually enable these push protections, and we can deploy that to our 150 organizations at once. So that's the power of using this kind of tool. So there are many alternatives. I won't go. Uh, I won't deep dive into every one of those, um, but we are pretty uh, sure that mm, each of those alternatives actually don't comply with all of our requirements. So that's why we had to um, create yet another one. So what's next? Um, so currently, uh, Autodog is a command line tool. Um, we plan to also create a GitHub app uh, in order to remove this manual step of applying and pushing the configuration to the repository. We'd like it to be a bit, a bit more streamlined, and also remove the need to maintain some tokens to have uh, faster reconciling. Um, and we also want to add for us, the security team, some more monitoring and alerting capabilities so the GitHub app will be able to tell us, okay, so this organization has some ch settings that have been changed, um, doesn't look okay, go and look af after that. So the takeaways is, uh, a strong governance is strong security to, to be able to enforce uh, those stuff, mm, though at scale requires tooling. There is no good um, default that doesn't never need to be override, overridden, so you need to provide this capability. Um, 
for GitHub management, GitHub organization management, Autodog make it easily applicable at scale. The, the last changes, the last change from GitHub or the last um, generally available f settings at GitHub um, demonstrate that. Um, and we do that while still allowing the, the overriding. So as a final last word, I would like to thank uh, OpenSF and for Mega projects that enabled us to um, create this tool. And um, I may have one minute for one question, uh, if you have any. So the question is, do, do we have any pushback from the repository owner? They are not owner, they, are just, they just have write permission on it. But um, do we have any pushback from them having to create PR? Uh, they don't have to create PR, they can, but they, and, but they can still open a, a ticket out or help us to um, exchange some of the settings. Um, no, we didn't get pushback because what we provide now is actually a view on their current settings. Previously, they had no um, view, they, they couldn't read. The, the, the settings of the organization. So at some point when you want to add a new branch protection rules or if you want to enable some settings, you had to first ask, is it enabled or not? <laughs> so no, no pushback. And uh, again, the, the first step when we deploy the tool is to be non-disruptive. So they, they, they get to use Autodog without knowing that they use Autodog. Thank you for your attention. I'm still there uh, until tomorrow evening, so if you want to talk again uh, deep more, uh, be available outside otherwise. Thank you very much. Talk to you soon.